Some words from the Psalms. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night, to the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands I sing for joy. Well, let us sing for joy together as we begin our service with hymn number 324, number 324, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. So let's sing 324.
Well, let us bow our heads together and we shall pray. He speaks, we've just sung, he speaks and listening to his voice, new life the dead receive. The mournful broken hearts rejoice, the humble poor believe. Let us come to him now gladly. We are the humble poor, and yet we fix our hope and our confidence upon him. It may be also that there are mournful and broken hearts with us here this morning. Well, let them too lift themselves up to him, knowing that there is joy, there is blessing, there is healing and strength, which comes from the throne of heaven. So let us pray. Your grace, dear Heavenly Father, fills all your works. Indeed, your plan and purpose is gracious from beginning to end. Your words also are filled with grace and truth. They bring light to our understanding and joy to our hearts. And as we seek your face this morning, help us to see more of your purposes as you are working them out from the original creation to the new creation. Give us, we pray, a bigger and truer view of your greatness. Thrill our hearts with the sense of your covenant purposes, your promises which find all their fulfillment in your Son, Jesus Christ. We know and believe that he is the firstborn from the dead, the first man to be raised from death, never to die again, for death has no more dominion over him. We thank you that he died to bear the penalty for our sins in our place, and that he rose from the grave to inaugurate a new world. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. We pray, therefore, that you will help us to love him more, Indeed, in this coming hour, that you will help us to know him better and to long to see his face. Help us, dear Father, more deeply to repent, more truly to hate the sins that you hate, more fully to love all that you love. Take our natures, Lord God, so often disfigured by sin and by our frailty, and continue to remake them in the image of your Son, so that we may please you. And in the words of an old prayer, give us grace that we may cast away the works of darkness and put upon us the armor of light. Now in the time of this mortal life in which your son Jesus Christ came to visit us in great humility, that in the last day when he shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge both the living and the dead, we may rise to the life immortal through him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. <coughs> Amen. Well, let's look up there and let me say again how good it is to see everybody here, <coughs> particularly if you're here for the first time. And we do uh, ask you to, to come and make yourself known to us and shake a hand at the end. Uh, we'd be delighted to get to know you a little bit better. Now, just one or two things by way of notices. I think most of you will have, you all should have one of these uh, yellow leaflets, our usual weekly leaflet, and it's full of information. Do take it away with you and uh, use it to, to be informed, but also uh, for your prayers for events over the coming few days. Can I point out two things in particular? First of all, we have our congregational prayer meeting this Wednesday evening at half past seven. Do come and join us if you possibly can, because it's a, a most important time for us to be together and to pray to the Lord and to ask his blessing on gospel work overseas and gospel work at home as well. So that's Wednesday evening. And let me mention also um, our minister, Willie Phillip, has just produced a new book, Songs for a Saviour's Birth. I think we have uh, several thousand copies down in the book room. But, but do buy that, and I think we still have an offer, don't we? £6.99 for one copy, £7.99 for two copies. 
In other words, one pound for an extra copy, as long as you give it away to a friend. So think of your, your relatives and friends who are not Christians, and you'd, you'd love to introduce them to the Lord Jesus. This could be just the book for them as a little gift this Christmas time. Good. Well, we come now to, oh, there's one other important thing. Ladies, fellowship meal. That's tomorrow night, Monday the 28th. The venue, if you're booked into the ladies' um, fellowship meal, the venue is the New Scholars Restaurant at 190 Cathedral Street. Doors open 12 noon, try to be seated by 12.20. So New Scholars Restaurant, 190 Cathedral Street, if you're in that bracket. <coughs> Good, well, let's turn to our Bible reading now. Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. Our preacher this morning is Terry McCutcheon, and he's going to be opening up this first chapter of Matthew. And as you look at Matthew chapter 1, you may be saying to yourself, how is it possible to preach a sermon on this passage? Well, by the grace of God, we shall know shortly. <clears throat> so Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 to 17. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David the king. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam the father of Abijah, and Abijah the father of Asaph, and Asaph the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat the father of Joram, and Joram the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah the father of Jotham, and Jotham the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh the father of Amos, and Amos the father of Josiah, and Josiah the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel, and Shealtiel the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Abiud, and Abiud the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim the father of Azor, and Azor the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Achim, and Achim the father of Eliud, and Eliud the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar the father of Mathan, and Mathan the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. So, all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. This is the wonderful word of the Lord, and may it be a blessing to us this morning. <clears throat> Well, now we're going to sing together again. Let's turn in our hymn books to number 749. 749. Oh, how the grace of God amazes me. 749.
But now we have a quiet interlude. There'll be some music, a chance for us to pray, perhaps to read over that Matthew 1 passage again as our offering is taken up now. Let us pray together again. <clears throat> Some words from the Apostle Peter about the new birth into the new family of the Lord Jesus. Having purified your souls by obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. We do thank you, our dear Heavenly Father, for the love that you have commanded us to show to one another in the family of your people, brothers and sisters living together in love and confidence. We want to thank you too that the Lord Jesus has commanded us to love one another as he has loved us. Please help us, therefore, to love your church and to serve your people joyfully. Help us to be involved in the very best and most profitable ways with our brothers and sisters and to know best how to use our time and energies to build up the family life of the Lord's people and to support the work of the gospel. And so we pray, dear Father, that the qualities of our Christian relationships will be a blessing also to those outside the church, that those outside who are perhaps feeling their way towards faith will see Christian husbands and wives caring for each other with kindness and tenderness, that they will see Christian parents and children living together in an atmosphere of good discipline and happy personal communication and love. Help all of us, dear Lord, married and single, to live lives of wholesome self-discipline and chastity in a world which has lost sight of the blessing of marital fidelity and self-control. Help us to demonstrate in our lives and our attitudes what it means to be men and women, male and female, as you have ordained it to each of us. And help us in our church family life more and more to reach out to those who are adrift and lost those who are without hope, without love, and without God, and without security. We pray especially for those who have been torn from their own countries and cultures because of pressures that became too great for them to bear.
We pray for those who seek asylum and acceptance and work in a country very different from their own country. And we pray above all that they will find their greatest and most lovely security in the forgiveness of sins and in belonging to the Lord's family, to the people whose eternal home is beyond any culture. So hear our prayer, dear Father, that our church family life should be the means of many hearing the gospel and coming to Christ. And we ask it all in the name of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus. Amen. <coughs> Amen. Well, before, before we have the sermon, let's turn to hymn number 381. <coughs> 381. <coughs> the promised time arrives, the time of God's appointing, the time when one is born who bears the Lord's anointing. 381. I invite you to take your Bibles and to turn with me again to Matthew chapter 1, which you will find on page 807 of the Pew Bible. Matthew chapter 1, page 807. And as you turn up that page, a moment of prayer. Our Father, as we are gathered in this place this morning, as we are gathered in this place and around this book, the book of your word concerning your Son, our deep conviction is that the Son of God is here. He is here by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is here, so full of truth and grace. And in looking to Him, we find that Your glory, dear Father, is disclosed upon a human face, the face of Your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as we are gathered around this book, we ask that You would make this book live to us, O Lord, Show us thyself within thy word. Show us ourselves and show us the face and the grace of our Saviour and make the book live to us for Jesus' sake. Amen. 
I wonder if you are familiar with the television programme, Who Do You Think You Are? It sounds like the first line of a, an argument, doesn't it? Who do you think you are? <laughs> but for those not familiar with the show, let me just explain what the programme is all about. The programme really is a, a, a genealogy documentary that explores the, the family tree, the, the family line of some of our British celebrities. Some of the well-known faces from the world of film, television, media, and the world of music. And the celebrity highlighted in each program climbs back through the years, back through the history and the ancestry of their family, not knowing what they will uncover as they seek to trace through the help of the program's ex experts, as they seek to trace where they came from and who they came from. And I'm sure you can imagine quite a few surprises are, are usually thrown up during this process of who their relatives were, what they were, and what they done. Well, the show returned to our, our TV screens this week, Thursday night, 8 p.m., BBC One. And the celebrity that was highlighted this week was a fella called Danny Dyer. Danny Dyer. He is an actor who was born in the East End of London, and rather appropriately, he appears in the BBC One soap, EastEnders. He plays the part of a character called Mick Carter, who's the landlord of the Queen Vic, the local pub. Now, I know that sounds as if I watch EastEnders, but actually, Willie Phillip told me. Um, <laughs> I get all my soap gossip for Willie Phillip. But through the course of the programme, and as the experts trace Danny Dyer's family tree, a very interesting relative, to say the least, was revealed. In EastEnders, Danny Dyer is the landlord of the Queen Vic pub. But in real life, he is the 22-time great-grandson of one of the former kings of our country, King Edward III. And this revelation came as a massive shock to Danny Dyer. I'm related to King Edward III. Before the programme, he said, people are going to expect me to be related to criminals and crooks, but I would like to freak them out by being descended from aristocracy. Now, there were plenty of criminals and crooks in his ancestry, but never for one moment did Danny die. I think he would be descended from aristocracy, never mind a former king. Now, all of us have a family tree, a family history, a family line. And if our family trees were traced, then I am sure they would throw up eye-popping, jaw-dropping, stomach-turning facts about our ancestors. Maybe we wouldn't all be related to royalty. I'm sure in my case it would be rascals. We wouldn't all be related to royalty like Danny Dyer or one or two in our congregation. But all of our family trees would have interesting items in them and interesting people in them. But here is the question. Why did Matthew include this family tree at the beginning of his gospel? I mean, look at it. It doesn't fill me with great enthusiasm, nor does it give me a great dose of encouragement as I read it through. I mean, look at it. Zerubbabel became the father of Abiud. Abiud became the father of Eliakim. Eliakim became the father of Azor, and Azor became the father of Zadok. Are those names that were on your mind when you woke up this morning? Or any other morning in history for that matter? No, of course they weren't. I mean, I could hardly pronounce some of the names. So why did Matthew begin his gospel this way? Why did he give us a Christmas family tree? I mean, friends, I don't know about you, but I take one look at verses 1 to 17, and if I'm going to be frankly honest, I want to begin reading at verse 18. So why do we have this Christmas family tree? Well, Matthew isn't a stupid fellow. He isn't unintelligent. Matthew knew what he was doing. He has good reasons for beginning his gospel this way. There are many reasons as to why Matthew began his gospel this way, and we can't tackle them all this morning in one sermon. But we will tackle uh, three, three reasons as to why he gave us this Christmas family tree. The first two reasons will be rather brief, so don't think you're getting out before 12. But then the third reason, the last reason, will be a wee bit more length. So why did Matthew give us a Christmas family tree? Well, firstly, verse 1, to fill you with God's hope. To fill you with God's hope. If you look at verse 1, verse 1 is not actually part of the family tree. Verse 1 is actually the title for the whole book of Matthew. Verse 1 is the title of the book. It's not part of the family tree, but it introduces the family tree. Verse 1, 
the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, that phrase that Matthew has just used in verse 1 is like a phrase that's repeated over and over and over again in the book of Genesis. I think uh, Moses employs that phrase about 10 times um, in the book of uh, Genesis. These are the generations of so-and-so. These are the family histories of so-and-so. The translation varies. But only in one of those 10 times is there a kind of a phrase like verse 1 of Matthew. And you will find that in Genesis chapter 5, verse 1. If you just keep your finger in Matthew chapter 1 and, and just turn up Genesis chapter 5, it's at the beginning of your Bible. And here's what Moses writes. This is the book of the generations of Adam. This is the book of the histories of Adam. Now, Matthew begins his gospel this way, the book of the generations of Jesus Christ. If you were a Jew reading Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, you would say to yourself, oh, that's just like Genesis chapter 5, verse 1. Genesis chapter 5, like Matthew chapter 1, is full of the phrase, and he fathered, and he fathered. But as well as the repeated phrase of, and he fathered in Genesis 5, you will see that there is another phrase that's repeated in Genesis 5. It appears firstly there in verse 5 in relation to Adam, and he died. Then in verse 8 in relation to Seth, and he died. Again, verse 11, and he died. Verse 14, and he died. Verse 17, and he died. And he died, and he died, and he died. Over and over again, due to the wages, the curse of sin. Genesis begins in chapter 1 with creation and ends in chapter 50 with a coffin in Egypt, the coffin of Joseph. It begins with life in Adam, but it ends with that same phrase, and he died. But friends, Matthew is saying here in verse 1, that may have been so with Adam and with the book, The Generations of Adam, but now, but now we have another story. This is the book of the generations, the book of the history of Jesus Christ. This is a new beginning. Here is the second Adam. And this book, this history, this story does not end the same way as Adam's history does. Matthew in his gospel brings us to a different end. His gospel does not end in death. His gospel begins with Jesus Christ and ends with an empty tomb and the resurrection of the dead. Matthew wants to fill us with God's hope, the hope of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't end with, and he died. There is hope. Well, does it make any difference? Well, yes, it does. If you know and love and trust the Lord Jesus Christ, then it does make a difference, a world of a difference, an eternity of a difference. Matthew fills us with God's hope. He wants us to be caught up personally in this story. The story of Jesus Christ that ends with an empty tomb and not with the phrase, and he died. Matthew wants to fill us with God's hope. But secondly, Matthew gives us a Christmas family tree in order to encourage you with God's persistence. To encourage you with God's persistence. If you take a look at verses 2 to 16, you will note that they are um, in three groups Verse 2 to 6, verse 6 to 11, and verse 12 to 16. And each of these paragraphs details a a section of Israel's history. Begins with Adam and goes all the way up to David the king. It doesn't start that big or that great, but rather fragile with Abraham. But it comes down the line, all the while growing to David. To David the king and the golden era, the golden age of Israel's history. Then to Solomon, verse 6, down to Rehoboam, verse 7. And the whole golden era begins to unravel. God's people become a a faithless people. Sure, they have some godly kings in this era, Josiah, Hezekiah, and one or two others. But they've got some right rotten ones as well, Ahaz and Manasseh. And so God has to bring judgment on his people for their faithlessness and their disobedience. And so they're taken captive to Babylon. They're taken into exile in Babylon. 
And in verses 12 to 16, you have a list of his faltering people as they come back from exile to the land of Israel. And when they come back to the land, they're always under foreign rule, under foreign domination. If it's not the Babylonians, it's the Persians. If it's not the Persians, it's the Assyrians. If it's not the Assyrians, then it's the Romans. This is the history of God's people. Fragile, faltering, faithless people. But God still brings forth his Messiah. And he does so not because his people are great. He does so not because his people are successful. He does so not because his people are outstanding. He does so because of the total opposite of these things. In spite of these things. In spite of this, God still brings forth the one through whom and in whom they would be blessed. Matthew is teaching us about the persistence. God will make sure that verse 16 happens. And verse 16 will happen not because of his people, but in spite of his people. And look at the time of this in verse 12 to 16. This was not the most promising time in Israel's history after the captivity in Babylon. In fact, it was one of the most darkest periods in Israel's history. Sure, they were back in the land, but they had no king. They were under foreign rule. What good could possibly come from this period in their history? God's promise to Abraham about the land, well, it seems to have gone. And God's promise to David that one of his line would always rule as king over the people, well, that's also gone. No land, no king. This was the most bleak and unpromising time in Israel's history. What were those 500 years of verses 12 to 16 like for the people of God? Well, life was hard. It seemed like the sun was never shining. The people had to scrimp and scrape just to have an existence. Yet at this time when it was so bleak, at this time when the sky was darkest, it was at this time that the sun of righteousness arose and began to shine. It's really strange, isn't it? Matthew is teaching us of God's persistence, of his persistence to bring forth his promised king, even at the darkest hour. Matthew has given us a Christmas family tree to fill you with God's hope, to encourage you with God's persistence. And thirdly and finally, and at a bit more length, to amaze you with God's grace. To amaze you with God's grace. That's the, 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 the title of the hymn that we sang earlier. Oh, how the grace of God amazes me. Question, have you ever been amazed by the grace of God? Well, if not, today's your lucky day. Matthew gave us this family tree for Christmas in order that you would be amazed with the grace of God. In verses 3 to 6, Matthew include, includes in the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ the names of four women. Tamar, verse 3. Rahab, verse 5. Ruth, verse 5. And the wife of Uriah, verse 6. Do you know these ladies? Have you heard of them? Do you know their stories? Well, we can find the story of Tamar back in Genesis 38. Abraham had a son called Isaac. Isaac had a son called Jacob. Jacob, well, he is the one who had 12 sons, the 12 tribes of Israel. And one of his sons was, was Joseph. But Jacob's fourth oldest son was a fella called Judah. Now, Tamar, Tamar had married Judah's oldest son. But before she could bear him any children, he died. And in keeping with the commands given by the Lord in Deuteronomy 25 concerning Leverite marriage, because she had no children and to carry on the family line and the, the family name, Judah's second oldest son, Onan, married Tamar. So he marries Tamar, but again, he dies before she bore any children. And Tamar's a bit of a jinx, isn't she? But Judah had another son, Shelah. But Judah said to Tamar, look, I've got another son, but he's a bit young at the moment, you know, to marry you. So what I want you to do is, just for a period, I want you to remain as a widow, and I want you to go back and stay in your father's house. And when Sheila has grown up, I'll send for you, and we can get the marriage kind of arranged then. So Tamar agrees, she goes back to stay um, in, in her father's house. But Judah had no intention of allowing Sheila to marry Tamar. 
as he feared his son would end up dead like the first two. And neither did he have any intention of facing Tamar up and telling her that this was the case. So Tamar did as Judah had requested and went and stayed in her father's house. But over time, Tamar realized that Sheila's grown up. Judah's never sent for me and arranged the marriage. She knew that Judah had never any intention of arranging the marriage. Well, at this time, Judah's wife had died. And after his period of grieving, he was going with a friend of his to a sheep shearing festival. And friends, that doesn't, um, that's not as innocent as it sounds. These sheep shearing festivals were events that were greatly associated with great sexual immorality. So Moses, the writer of Genesis, wants us to understand that this was what was on the mind of Judah. Yes, Judah, the patriarch. This is what was on the mind of Judah, sexual immorality, as he headed to the festival. And when Tamar heard that her father-in-law was going to shear his sheep, I think she understood what was on Judah's mind as well. And this helps us to make sense of what she did next. When she hears that Judah is going to shear his sheep, she threw off her widow's clothes. And knowing what was on her father-in-law's mind, she dressed up as a Canaanite prostitute, wrapping herself with a veil and standing by the roadside on the way to the place where Judah was going. Well, Judah came by and he saw her, and he did not recognize her to be his daughter-in-law. He thought her to be a prostitute. And he said to her, let me come in and lie with you. What will you give me, she replied. I will send you a young goat from the flock, he said. Well, how do I know I can trust you? You must give me a pledge, something to hold so that I know you will make good on your pledge. But what should I give you, asked Judah. Tamar said, give me your signet, your cord, and your walking stick, which was a modern-day equivalent of him giving his credit card or his master card. Judah duly obliges. They sleep together, and then Judah goes on his merry way to go and shear some more sheep. And later he sends a friend with the goat to pay off the debt, but the prostitute woman is nowhere to be found. So Judah says, oh well, just let the thing be. But three months later, Judah is told, Tamar, your daughter-in-law has been immoral. And not only that, she has become pregnant due to her immorality. Response to this by ordering, bring her out and let her be burned. And as she's brought out, Tamar plays her trump card or her master card producing the signet, the cord, and the walking stick. She says, By the man to whom these belong, I am pregnant. The man whose name is on these, Judah ben Jacob. Judah, son of Jacob. And then Jacob makes the statement, She has been more righteous than I, since I did not give her to my son, Sheila. So that's Tamar. And she bore two sons to her father-in-law, whose names are Perez and Zerah. You will find them in verses 1 to 17. So there in the line, in the ancestry of the Messiah, is Tamar. Then there is Rahab, verse 5. You will find Rahab's story in Joshua chapter 2. You may remember it from earlier in the year in the series that Paul has been doing in Joshua. Well, Rahab was the Canaanite prostitute, the pagan prostitute. And she welcomed the spies of Israel. And then she said she wanted to be safe and that she wanted to follow Israel's God. And this pagan prostitute sought mercy from Israel's God. And this pagan prostitute received mercy from Israel's God. Well, next is Ruth. You will find her in the book of the Bible named after her. Bob File covered the book earlier this year. Well, Ruth was from, from Moab. She was a, a Moabite. The Moabites were Israel's enemies. And according to Deuteronomy, Moabites were not allowed into the worshipping congregation of God. She wasn't an Israelite. She didn't belong. She didn't belong among the official people of God. And she came back to Israel from Moab with her Israeli mother-in-law, Naomi. Naomi had went to stay in Moab some 10 years earlier with her husband and her two sons. But she had lost everything during her stay in Moab. Her husband died, and her two sons died. And Ruth, well, she was married to one of the sons. Well, Naomi had made her mind, uh, mind up to go back to stay in Israel, and she pleaded with Ruth, pleaded with Ruth not to come with her. 
Now, friends, Naomi done this because she knew life was going to be tough back in Israel. Not only because they had no man to provide for them, not only because they had no man to protect them, but Naomi also knew that life would be very difficult and could be very dangerous for Ruth. But she was a Moabite. She was a foreigner, an enemy of Israel who didn't belong. But despite all of this, Ruth covenanted herself to her mother-in-law. But more importantly, she covenanted herself to her mother-in-law's God, Yahweh, the God of Israel. And she came back to stay with her mother-in-law in Bethlehem, even though it looked like a life of pure poverty would be ahead of her. And then there is in verse 6, the wife of Uriah. Matthew doesn't even call her by her own name. He calls her Mrs. Uriah. Her name was Bathsheba. But Matthew calls her Mrs. Uriah to remind us of what happened. And you will find Mrs. Uriah's story back in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11 begins, In the time that kings go out to war, well, in the time that kings go out to war, we are told that King David didn't go out to war. His army went out to war, but he stayed at home. And late one afternoon, while he was walking on his roof, he saw a beautiful woman bathing. And he inquired of his servants as to who this beautiful woman was. And King David was told, she is Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah. Knowing that she was married, and actually married to a man who was actually out fighting for him in his army, knowing that she was married and married to Uriah, did not put King David off. He sent for her, and he took her, and he lay with her. Well, I suppose David thought that was that. But Bathsheba sent and told David, I'm pregnant. Now, David had a problem in his hands, and he thought to himself, well, I know what I'll do. I will cover up my sin. I will send for her husband Uriah. I will send for him and I'll bring him back for the war and I'll send him up the road to see his wife and they'll sleep together and therefore Uriah will think the baby's his and I'll cover up what I've done. But Uriah wouldn't go up the road to his wife. And when David asked why, Uriah said, how could I go up the road and enjoy the comforts of my home and the comforts of my wife when the rest of the army, my brothers, are out there camping in an open field? So the next day, David thought he would try again. He invites uh, Uriah for a meal. He feeds him, um, and he fills him with booze as well, gets Uriah drunk. But still, Uriah would not go and enjoy the comforts of his own bed and the comforts of his own wife. So King David had to come up with another plan, another plan to cover up his sin. The friends, what David did with Bathsheba, sleeping with her, shows that he was a real warm, red-blooded male, and if us real, warm, red-blooded male are honest, we know that this is a sin that, given the right set of circumstances and situations, we are all very much capable of. But what David was about to do next wasn't warm and red-blooded. It was cold-blooded and calculated. David sent a letter to the commander-in-chief of the army that was actually delivered by the, the hand of Uriah. And in that letter, David gave instructions that Uriah was to be put, put in the front line where the fighting was at its hardest. But then when the fighting was at its hardest, the men all round about Uriah were to draw back from him so that he might be exposed and be struck down and die. And that's exactly what happened. Uriah and a few other men were struck down and killed. Or if you want to call a spade a spade. Murdered, really in order that the king's sin with Mrs. Uriah might be covered up. So here we have these four ladies. And three of the four are not Israelites. They are Gentiles, non-Jews, pagans. And all of them except Ruth have sexual escapades involved with immoral sex. And here they are in the family tree, the family line of Jesus the Messiah. It's absolutely amazing. It's absolutely unthinkable. I mean, if you were wanting to talk about the mothers of Israel, if you were wanting to talk about Israel's great women, any Jew would talk about the wives of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They would talk about Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah. They would be the women that you would talk about. But Matthew doesn't even give those women a mention. 
Instead, Matthew talks about Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Mrs. Uriah. And anybody who knows the history of Israel would read these verses, and these names would be highlighted like they were in neon lights. These names would jump right off the page. They would light up and jump off the page, not for the best reasons, but for these women's bad reputations. You see, friends, that's why Matthew has given us a Christmas family tree. Matthew here draws us. He draws us on the very first page of the New Testament. He draws us here in these verses to the amazing grace of God. This is the God we are dealing with. A God who is willing to have dealings with the likes of Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Mrs. Well, what does all of this have to say to us today, friends? Well, it tells you that if you have people like Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Mrs. Uriah in the family tree of Jesus, if you've got people like that included in the family tree of Jesus and the fellowship of Jesus, then no matter what sort of a person I am, then that same Jesus will be prepared to have dealings even with me. If he has people like these four women in his family tree, do you think he will be ashamed to have them in his congregations? Do you see the grace of God that is highlighted here? But you know, friends, some of you don't yet quite believe it. You say, oh, yes, I see what Matthew has written, and I can hear what Terry is saying. But you know, there's this one sin that I committed. I can't escape it. It's ever before me. I can't escape it. It haunts me. It happened a year ago. Or was it three years ago? Was it 15 years ago? 30 years ago? Or maybe even 50 years ago? I don't know when it was. But you know, don't you? You see, I can't escape it. It haunts me. I just can't see how Jesus could forgive me and receive me. Well, I don't mean to be rude and I don't mean to cut you off. But Bathsheba has just walked in. And she says, Terry, did I hear someone say something about that one big sin that they committed? Well, I know what that's like. David always gets the blame for what happened. David always gets the bad press. Even as you told the story in your sermon, Terry, you put the blame fairly and squarely on David. David always gets the blame. But I was married. I made marriage vows. I could have said no. But I didn't. I consented. And yet, and yet it didn't keep me out of the family tree of the Lord Jesus. Someone else might say, if, if you only knew my family background, my connections, if you only knew what my upbringing was like, how lewd and how awful that was. Well, in walks Ruth. She says, yes, I was a Moabite. You know, I still am. And you know, according to Deuteronomy 23, the Moabites weren't ever to be allowed into the worshipping congregation of the Lord. But the Lord didn't seem to think my background disqualified me from becoming an ancestor and the great, 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 great grandmother of Jesus Christ, his son. You, you may say, Terry, if you only knew the sort of life I have lived of my own choice, before I ever took a seat here in the Tron Church. That may be so. But here comes Rahab. I really like Rahab. She doesn't mess about. She gets right to the point. She is like that because of her background. And she says, there isn't any sordid, immoral, horrible sexual stuff that I don't know about. Sordid, immoral, horrible sexual stuff is what I did for a living. And yet, and yet even I was able to find mercy. <laughs> to find mercy under the wings of the Lord, Israel's God. Do you see the point, friends? The point that Matthew is making. He is making the point that Jesus Christ is not ashamed to be associated with sinners. Oh, you're right. He will be criticized for doing so. He always has been. He was accused of being the friend of tax collectors and sinners. He was the friend of tax collectors and sinners. And he is still their friend today. 
In fact, that's why he came. Matthew chapter 1, 21. And she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Why? For he shall save his people from their sins. You wouldn't give a doctor a hard time for going to visit the sick. Because that's his business. Don't give Jesus Christ a hard time for welcoming sinners. For that is why he came. That's why it says the Tron Church in big letters outside our building. It doesn't say the Tron Club. No, the Tron Church. Why? Because the church is a hospital for sinners. A shelter for refugees seeking the grace of God. And if Jesus didn't bat an eyelid at being associated with Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Mrs. Uriah, do you think he'll get a brass neck by acknowledging you? Do you think he will be ashamed to acknowledge you? Well, do you? Matthew has given us in these opening verses of his gospel a Christmas family tree. He has given us a Christmas family tree in order that you would be filled with God's hope, in order that you would be encouraged by God's persistence, and in order that you, even you, might be amazed by God's amazing grace. Oh, how I wish that God's grace would amaze you this Christmas. There is much, much more I could say, but being left in the arms of God's grace is not a bad place to leave things. Let us pray. Oh, Father, we thank you that you are a God who is willing to have dealings with people like Tema, Rahab, Ruth, and Mrs. Uriah. And not only that, we thank you that you are a God who is willing to have dealings with people like us. We thank you, Father, that you are more willing to deal with us than we are to let you deal with us. But deal with us, we pray, through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and for his great glory alone. Amen. Well, to close, friends, we sing in our blue hymn books, number 369. Oh, what a mystery. We have read of all those who were part of the family tree that brought the Lord Jesus Christ into the world. We can't be part of the family tree that brings the Lord Jesus Christ into the world. But if you trust the Lord Jesus Christ and become a Christian, you can be part of the family tree that brings the Lord Jesus Christ to the world. Look at verse 3. By faith a child of his I stand, an heir in David's line, royal descendant by his blood, destined by love's design. Fathers of faith, my fathers now, because in Christ I am, and all God's promises in him to me are yes. Amen.
what a Savior, what a Lord. O Master, brother, friend, what miracle has joined me to this life that never ends? That's the gift that God wants to give to all of us this Christmas time. All who trust the Lord Jesus Christ, I hope you receive it. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit the Comforter be with us all and those whom we love, both now and forevermore. Amen.